You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and what you're about to listen to is a conversation between myself and yet another artist from Perth, an excellent city for music is Perth. The gent's name is Matthew Burke, and he fronts and is the creative brains behind Foreign Architects. The reason for the conversation is to promote Foreign Architects' brand new EP. It goes by the name of Coasters and Caravans. Let's see what Matt has to say. Here we go. Calling through for our chat. How are you going? Yeah, great. Thanks, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. Sounds like you're on the road. I am. Sorry. I'm, um, no, no drums. Traffic was really bad. <laughs> I'll be at a quieter <laughs> spot in about one minute. Sorry. No, no, no dramas whatsoever. It's always interesting when someone's uh, transiting from one place to another, mate. So do you mind if I uh, inject into the interview this question here? What Are you, where, are you driving Absolutely. from rehearsal or somewhere interesting or just coming back from work? Um, kind of in the middle, I'd say. I'm, um, I'm in the back of an Uber on the way to a mate's um, surprise birthday party that we're having at a quiz night in suburban Perth. Nice. Okay. How old's your mate turning? Uh, he's 25, I think. That's a good age. Savour it. I'm 40. It's 15 years ago for me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about 25 is, mate, you've got a little, you, you get a wise head on your shoulders by then because you've been burnt enough by life, but at the same time, you've still got enough energy to start all over again and to have a bit of fun. Exactly. Yeah, I reckon. You know, so, yeah, so sure. mate, Foreign Architects, your new EP, Coasters and Caravans. Now, I've already alluded to my age or mentioned it outright, but the fact is I've got two kids and I've mentioned this a few times, so please take this in the in the greatest spirit of receiving good feedback about the, the EP. Absolutely. Um, I listened to this just a moment ago, actually, around the kids as we were having dinner, mate, and they're grooving along to it. So obviously oh, brilliant. It's, it's music to my ears. Now, this is what I came up with. So I'll just mention that I've been listening to this music around my kids when they've been having dinner also when I'm showering them and bathing them and all sorts of stuff. So it's been amiable entertainment for that. <laughs> but another thing I picked up about it was this, okay? Yep. So this is what it reminded me of away from all of that. If I could paint the scenario, 6 p.m. on a sure Friday thing. night, work is finished. The first beer or alcoholic beverage has been consumed and the night's just getting started. There you go. So I, th <laughs> I think for the broader audience, that's probably how people can relate to it. But what are your thoughts on the EP? Oh, I love that description. That's great. <laughs> I um, yeah, I think we um, we sort of stepped in a new direction and injected a lot more synthesizers than we probably ever had before into the music. So it was um, yeah, definitely a, a really interesting vibe. I think we went for I think a few different sort of songs. They're all kind of written as a bunch, but at slightly different times. So um. Yeah, so I hope it's a diverse sort of sound, something for our old fans and, and something new as well for uh, the things that haven't heard us before. Yeah. The other thing was talking about musical references. Now, I always do this when I'm listening to a band who I don't have much background on. So the, sure. mu the musical references that I found or I could relate to were Cut Copy, mm -hmm. Miami Horror, LCD Sound System, Empire of the Sun and a bit of Weezer and the Rentals. What do you think? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like I think. Um. Yeah. I think a lot of those the synthy kind of dance stuff we've um gravitated towards. I think we're just getting a bit. None of us really even play uh play keys very well at all. But we um sort of gravitate to all the toys in the studio, and it seems to come out and hopefully complement the music a lot. Yeah. Alongside our guitars. Hmm. Yeah. I, I like the way you've managed to blend everything together because oftentimes you don't actually notice that the guitar has started and taken over from the synth and vice versa and I love it when someone who's as adept at their craft as clearly what you are manages to do that because oftentimes there's quite a I won't mention the other bands by name but but some cuts <laughs> they come in and you're so totally aware of when the different changes and phases and the different parts of a song appear you sort of you feel like as though you're on a bit of a a stop and start ride, but yours is more like a roller coaster where you're being gently sort of taken through the different peaks and valleys of a roller coaster, if you like, in a really good way. I say that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, I think we um certainly spent a lot of time arranging and just sort of making sure that everything in the song had a had a bit of a purpose. You know, there, there's some um, which you know may have really obvious 
sort of synth hooks or, or obvious sort of guitar hooks and there's like a, a bed underneath it that sort of keeps going throughout segments to sort of give it a, a bit of continuity and we'll, um, yeah, sort of discovered a, a few nice analog synths and stuff that we, we use in the process, which I think sort of helped not be too obnoxious. Um, mm. The songs that we didn't want them to be anyway. Yeah, and what inspired you to create this type of music? Did you did you start out playing synthesizer music, or is this just an evolution of when you played the guitar and you landed here? Yeah, I think so. I think um, just a, a pretty natural progression. I mean, sort of, I've been playing guitar for yeah quite a quite a while now. So I just sort of looking outside the box. I think what maybe would have caught me was last year the Jungle Giants Quiet Frosty record. Um, came out and it was just a an incredibly concise um, arrangement of songs and within each song just everything was in its place the the grooves were just all there there was nothing too understated or overstated about it and it, it just really worked I think that probably had a a really big influence on on some of the songs we've always sort of like bands like Foster the People that blend guitars and synthesizers mm-hmm. together in a in a pretty big way as well. So I think those kind of influences definitely crept in also. Yeah. Talking about your guitar influences, did you do the thing where you start out playing along to Kurt Cobain riffs and took it from there, or did you start out somewhere else? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that kind of thing, I, I started playing classical guitar in, in primary school, like a, a lot of nerdy kids like myself probably do as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then kind of got onto that sort of that sort of stuff. Swapped the, um, the classical guitar for an acoustic guitar, and then and then electric guitar, and then yeah, just kind of built on it from there, and let the hair grow a bit, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and is is Foreign Architects is it a band as such? Now I understand that for all intents and purposes it presents as a band but I think you understand what I'm asking is it yourself and you just issue instructions to the other three guys that are in the band or or is it a genuine collaborative effort yeah I mean I I try and issue instructions they they don't often listen Um, yeah usually our (laughs) process is I'll I'll sort of write um, write at least the bare bones of a song and then bring it into um, to rehearsal or jam where it kind of gets fleshed out a bit more and we sort of add things you know there'll be other times when I'll just get carried away in the studio. I have the idea and I'll, I'll just hear it in my head and kind of lay it all down and, and bring it into the band. And if there's anything left, then they can try and bring something new to the table. Whereas other times I just bring in a skeleton. And yeah, sometimes I deliberately do that as well. I think, oh, I might be going into territory we've been in so many times before. I'm just going to stop this one right where it's chords and a melody and it doesn't really have much of a groove yet and, and see what the other guys can, can bring out of this one. Mm. Yeah, it's a you've my theory on I'm a musician as well. I need to share, and my theory on bands is that that they work best when an individual acts as a benevolent dictator, issuing instructions. If they're a democracy, they're horrendous. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think when they're um, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think if they're when when you hit that democratic sort of thing, and everyone has the I guess the right, or not the right, everyone always has the right to fight in something, but when it's normal for everyone to put an in input, I think there can be unnecessary pressure for people to feel like they need to, to put in an input where maybe, you know, the, the song is fine, but they say, oh, well, I you know, haven't really added anything to this. So, you know, why don't we just do this just for the sake of it so I can hmm. put in my two cents, whereas, you know, really often doesn't really need it. Hey, tell us about the experience over in Singapore, because I was reading on your bio there that you played Beer Fest, I think it was called, and you played, did you play in front of 30,000 people? I know it says attended by over 30,000 people, but was that the size of the audience that you performed in front of? I don't think it was probably that big when we were on the stage. I think that um, our publishers at the time gave us that figure. I think that was like the day's figure. So it was like a a massive tent that we were in front of. It was, um, yeah, it was a lot of people I, I wouldn't, really have a, a clue how many it was. I would guess that it probably wasn't 20,000 in front, but it was a, a great experience hmm. um, all up, notwithstanding just the fact that the rider was made up of the most amazing international beers that we'd never heard of before. <laughs> that was one of the, the biggest highlights. It is sort of meeting a lot of other musicians over there as well that are 
gone on to be really killing it at the moment as well. It's, it was really fun. How, how did you resist the temptation to drink the bloody rider before you went on stage? Or did you drink the rider and went on stage and just, just yeah. make sure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How'd you go? Yeah, that's an assumption you're making there. <laughs> we, um, it, was, it, was, it was very hot. Um, we, we did indulge a little bit. Um, but I think we were on quite early in the day a lot of the times because we, we were over there with a few other WA bands. Mm. Um, it's sort of like a rotating roster, so one of us would, would play earlier than then we could indulge a little bit more after that and, and vice versa. Um, yeah, we, we made it work and survive somehow. Tell me a little bit about the program that's going on, because I understand it's called the Singapore West Australian Music Exchange. How did you get involved in that? Because I've actually never heard of it before. It sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually too sure what the current status of it is. I haven't seen any... Um, any press stuff about it this year, but um, basically what it what it was and what it perhaps still is is the WAM, the the industry body um, for WA, like Sea Music in um, Queensland, um, teamed up with Music Singapore or SG Music as they're called, and um, basically they just got their their bands of of the, each sort of membership to to apply for it, and then the the other country had a, a panel of industry people who sort of selected who they thought would be best to bring across to their to their particular market. Um, so that was really, really great to do. It was sort of, we didn't have a lot of traction or momentum in Perth at the time. So that was a real big shot in the arm right? yeah. for us to be able to go and do it. And yeah, that was great because, I mean, necess- not necessarily a Wham might not have chosen us to play at their own showcase festival here, but, you know, Singapore or something you know that resonated with their industry so that was a really great experience two things there surprised me and i understand for a variety of reasons this occurs but your music's so accessible and could be played in such a variety of situations that it really surprises me that you weren't able to get more purchase in the industry in terms of getting interest if that's what you're saying but the other thing too is is that it's wonderful that an industry body could find another audience for you to perform in front of because I'm a massive advocate of Australian bands finding some turf in the Asian market, especially Southeast Asia. So Singapore, of course, is part of that. I only spoke to a Filipino black metal musician last week because my wife's half Filipino, so we spend a lot of time in the Philippines. And oh, wow, well, yeah. I know for a fact that if Australian bands were motivated to go over there, there's an audience there and there are promoters over there that are willing to have serious discussions. You're probably not going to make a ton of dough, but you could be, it could be the foot in the door for you to obtain an audience and you never know what happens from there. It might be the beginning of something special. You know, you know what I mean? Like Nobody's got a crystal ball on these things. Um, but the first, yeah. first part of my point there, did you find it hard to, to attract people to gigs? Was that the, the, was that the uh, focus of the comment you made or was it just that it was one of those things where you, you, you just sort of, keep on playing, keep on playing, and you just don't find any more audience, any more interest as building from, say, the initial interest you built off some of the uh, early releases that you put to market? Yeah, I think sort of um, a bit of both. We sort of felt like we were spinning our wheels um, a little bit. And it's, uh, you know, it's not to say that it's not hard work for everyone, but it just um, was a really pleasant surprise, I guess, to, to get that kind of opportunity. You know, we weren't really selling out rooms um, in Perth or, or doing anything miraculous like that. So to to only get a, a trip over there and play some shows and, and build some um, contacts over there was really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And did you, when you say build some contacts, were that were there meaningful contacts in so far as they they are, are contacts that you can now reach out to and perform more shows potentially? Yeah, I think um, we, we met a few of the um, the industry figures from over there. Nothing, I guess. Concrete has, has really came to fruition since then. Um, we, we still, you know, speak to our, some of the people we, we met over there and, and fans and stuff in Singapore. We, we'd absolutely love to, to get back into that market and to, to travel that area if the stars can sort of align for us in the future. And mm. a lot of the other musicians, it was really valuable to, um, to meet those as well. Yeah, cool. Now, I guess I've sort of alluded to this question here, but I'll ask it directly. What do you think the future holds for the band? So if you had a crystal ball and you could could make that what you see in the crystal ball a reality, what do you think the next five years holds? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think um, I think in in all honesty, we just want to keep creating good music and um, keep keep a good team around us. Uh, 
carve out those opportunities. I, I think any band sort of lying if if they don't say they want to tour more places and sell more CDs and sell more tickets and get their music played more. That's um, you know that's what it's about for for most of us. We're we're no different. We believe we're we're doing good things and we're uh, getting better and better at our craft and, and working hard. So we um yeah we just hope we can keep offering value to people and you know we just enjoy the the process of making the music that's all we can really control yeah that's a really good point actually a lot of it is out of your hands isn't it and i was listening to you might not be aware of the band but pepper keenan from the band corrosion of conformity talked today on jamie jaster's mm-hmm. excellent podcast and he was he's in his i assume he's in his 50s now um he's been sure. in the business for about as long as metallica have been doing it for now and uh he said words very similar sentiments were very similar to yours just then you can only really control yourself. You can only really have a bit of an impact, and the rest of it is completely out of your hands. So that's a pretty sage outlook that you've got there. Yeah, I think so. I think it sort of helps level things out as well. The, the moment you start to, um, not to say you shouldn't celebrate success, but if you sort of get carried away with it, the small successes equally, you'll probably expect it. And if, if things don't go your way, then you'll have the, the extreme lows as well. So it's Hmm. kind of best to just focus on the the stuff that you can directly control i find and just enjoy that as much as you can and whatever happens after that happens as long as you're you're doing the the sensible things Hmm. all right so for people that are going to be listening to this on my podcast series and also on my radio show for four triple z how can they how can they reach the band in so far as get in touch with you you have your social so i know for a fact you've got a very good facebook page but are you in Bandcamp? are you on spotify and also apple music yeah, we're on um, Spotify and Apple Music, um, SoundCloud, Triple J, and Earth, all the um, all the usual usual music streaming services. I think we've got a distribution deal with, so it should be pretty available. Um, or if you just kind of Google Google us, I'm sure something will pop up. Yeah, I can definitely say that's the case because that's what I did before our uh, before our call. Excellent. I like to I like to see what pops up, you know, what our interviews you've done, that sort of thing. So, uh, are you on Bandcamp though? I, I don't I haven't checked that you're on Bandcamp. I don't know Bandcamp's a wonderful platform. Yeah, I don't think we are at the moment. Actually, if we are, we don't control it. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to look into it though. <laughs> Um, oh, mate, that's it. Thank you so much for the conversation. Really appreciate it. You've got an outstanding release, this one here. I really hope that Coasters and Caravans does for you what it should do for you. Uh, so many great bands from Perth, and you're just another one that's producing really good, solid, original music. It's going to live a life well beyond the release date, mate, and I do genuinely mean that. So good luck to you and good luck to the members of the band as you go forth and prosper. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it chatting. No worries, mate. Look, uh, what I'll do is I'll post the discussion as a podcast episode. I don't edit anything, mate. I just tend to put it straight up there. And I've got a big audience in the in the US, actually. So um, that'll be interesting oh, to see awesome. if you get anybody reach out from there. Yeah, I don't know how it's happened, but it's happened. And that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, uh, absolutely. So hopefully uh, you get some some people reaching out to you from over there, mate, as a consequence of the podcast episode, at least. Ah, oh, that'd be sweet. Thank you so much. All right, mate. No worries at all. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, right. Andrew. Cheers, Enjoy mate. The party, mate. Okay, catch you. You have been listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and that was a conversation with Matthew Burke from Abandoned Perth called Foreign Architects. Thank you so much for listening.